Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Stefan Bouguan? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So first I'll look at the background of this case, then I'll move to my analysis. Stéphane Bouguan was born in Paris, France on March 14, 1953. He had some difficulties in high school. He was expelled on three separate occasions. He never graduated. He was described as a bit out of sync, always in his own little world, and as having an extreme attraction to the macabre. Stéphane found work as an assistant in a few pornographic movies. One source said they were minor movies, I didn't know that those types of movies were categorized as minor and major. I thought they were all kind of obscure, but I guess there are big hits in that industry. After this, he ran a small bookshop that specialized in mysteries and crime. Stefan had taken a particular interest in true crime, and specifically in serial killers. He accumulated a substantial knowledge on the topic of serial killers, such that he was able to impress people pretty easily with his stories. He memorized the killer's names, their murder victims, and dates of particular crimes. He was a walking encyclopedia of serial killer knowledge. In 1991, his talent impressed a French filmmaker who worked with Stefan to make a documentary about serial killers. As a part of making this film, Stefan interviewed a few serial killers like Otis Toole and Ed Kemper. It was clear from his behavior during the interviews that he was excited to meet the killers, he was more than simply curious, he was a fan. In a sense, it almost appeared as though he admired them. In 1992, the documentary was broadcast on television. After this, Stefan published several books about serial killers, including books on Jeffrey Dahmer, Jack the Ripper, and Albert DeSalvo, who was also known as the Boston Strangler. In a book about Elizabeth Short, the Black Dahlia, Stefan claimed that he solved the murder. Stefan was highly productive and became well-known. He would eventually publish over 75 books. He was featured in a number of documentaries, as well as appearing on several television and radio shows. Stefan had a number of fans. He had tens of thousands of followers on Facebook. If anyone on Facebook questioned whether he was really an expert or not, he would become defensive. As Stefan continued with his career as a famous author, he started making some claims that a few people who were watching him closely found suspicious. For example, instead of meeting with a few serial killers, he claimed that he met with 77 of them. He claimed that he supplied hundreds of hours of recordings from those interviews to the FBI. They thanked him by training him as an independent investigator. Interested parties could only find video recordings of seven or eight interviews performed by Stefan. Stefan started telling a story about how during the 1970s, he lived in the United States and was married to a woman named Eileen. He claimed that in 1976, Eileen was murdered and dismembered in their Los Angeles apartment. He was away and he discovered her when he returned. In some versions of the story, it wasn't his wife that was murdered, rather a girlfriend or a fiancé. The police told him a notorious serial killer had confessed to the crime. He asked for more information about serial killers, but nobody knew enough about them. He was unsatisfied. He started his own journey to discover the truth of what motivates a serial killer. Essentially, Stefan had created his own origin story. In addition to claims like this, we see that Stefan claimed that he had once been a next-door neighbor of Stephen King. Some of the passages in Stefan's books looked quite similar to what was in books from lesser-known authors who wrote in English. He made inconsistent statements about his interview with Ed Kemper. One time he said he interviewed Ed Kemper for several hundred hours, yet on another occasion he said he only briefly spoke with Kemper. All these factors increased the level of suspicion on Stefan. But at first, nobody was really making a big deal out of his indiscretions. Eventually, however, a substantial number of people became suspicious and formed an online group to investigate these inconsistencies. 
they called the group Fourth Eye. When looking at Stefan's story about Eileen, they found that in addition to the inconsistencies about who she was, wife, fiancé, or girlfriend, they could not figure out who the killer was. They searched public records, but there was no serial killer in California who matched Stefan's description of the crime. The group contacted 30 killers who supposedly had met with Stefan. Out of those who responded, many said they had not met him. For example, David Berkowitz and Dennis Rader indicated they had not met Stefan. The only ones who said they had met him were those killers who had been recorded for those documentaries. Stefan said that he met with Charles Manson in the early 1980s, but the administrator of Charles Manson's official website could not find any evidence of that interview. Fourth Eye group members found it curious that Stefan's stories about what happened when he met David Berkowitz and Charles Manson seemed awfully similar to the experiences of John Douglas, an FBI agent who wrote a book titled Mindhunter. A group member actually wrote to John Douglas. He responded by saying that Stefan was delusional and an imposter. He went on to state that Stefan became an expert by reading books, including his. The group would go on to discover more evidence of plagiarism in Stefan's books about Jeffrey Dahmer, Ed Kemper, and Elizabeth Short. Stefan was involved in a documentary in 1999 where he met a profiler in South Africa named Mickey Pistorius. Oscar Pistorius is her nephew. She gave Stefan a manuscript of her autobiography, which was getting ready to be published. Stefan wrote a book where he told a story that came from her book. He was standing next to Pistorius and another police officer at a serial killer's body disposal site when the rotor downwash from a landing helicopter sprayed them with bugs and decomposing body parts. Mickey Pistorius said that that story was true, but Stefan was not there when that happened. Stefan also said that he obtained a confession of a South African serial killer named Stuart Wilkin, but Pistorius said that that confession occurred two years before Stefan's arrival in South Africa. After the online group Fourth Eye collected all their evidence against Stefan, they took it to the media, but initially they were ignored. On social media specifically, they had better success getting their message out. People started to become aware of the story and became angry with Stefan. Some even accused him of being a serial killer. No evidence supports their claim. Stefan responded to the accusations by saying he was the victim of a harassment campaign. He wanted to know if his accusers had sold out theaters in 26 cities in a 2019 speaking tour. This seems like a very specific standard to apply to somebody in order for them to be credible. Like, isn't there any other way to establish credibility other than selling out theaters in one specific year? Stefan would eventually close his Facebook page and admit to a journalist that he had done a lot of exaggerating in his life. He said he just wanted to be loved. Stefan admitted that the FBI never trained him to be an independent investigator, and he admitted he had taken the story about the helicopter from Pistorius. He also revised his story about Eileen, now claiming that she was a bartender and sex worker named Susan Bickrist. He was once a customer of hers. He later found out that she had been murdered, possibly by a serial killer. He said it inspired him to interview Richard Chase in 1979 another notorious serial killer. It would appear as though Stefan thought these revisions to his stories would help his reputation, but the online group quickly discovered that Stefan had never interviewed Richard Chase, so he was trying to fix his initial lies with more deception. Stefan lost a lot of deals with publishers and producers. His most recent book was pulled from shelves, although he apparently self-published another book on Ed Kemper. There was even a television series on the way based on his life. He lost that too. It's worth noting that his life is still interesting enough for a TV series, one about a con artist as opposed to an author. Some people have tried to suggest that his interest in serial killers indicates that he is some type of terrible person. They say, what type of person would write books on this topic in the first place? Please check out my two books on serial killers, The Psychology of Notorious Serial Killers and Harm Reduction, this one is nonfiction, and harm reduction is fiction. They are available anywhere books are sold. Now moving to my analysis. 
Stefan really never took responsibility for his actions in any meaningful way. He said it was his fault, but then he continued to lie. He claimed that he received psychoanalysis, and the conclusion was that his parents were to blame. That is pretty much always the outcome of receiving psychoanalysis. The modality has a built-in bias against parents because of its emphasis on early childhood experiences. Whether Stefan's parents were to blame or not, his early experiences could have contributed to his behavior. When Stefan was young, he had a particular affinity for movies. He would recondition old movie tickets so he could sneak in to see the movies for free. He had a specific preference for American movies. He was fascinated by American culture. He traveled to the United States in the 1970s and met with directors and producers, desperately trying to get involved with the film industry. He was not successful. He returned to France, but he didn't tell any of his friends about a wife or fiancé being murdered. There was no discussion of a serial killer confession. He didn't talk about any of that with them. One would think that if it did happen, it's something that he would have mentioned. Like they might have said, hey, where's your wife? And he would have responded, well, that reminds me. A funny thing happened when I was in California. As he was getting popular as an author and was featured in documentaries, he only then started telling his friends the story about his wife being murdered. They couldn't understand what he was doing. It was almost like he couldn't remember his own lies. He was trying to deceive them as if they did not already know the story was false. They were insulted by his blatant prevarications and his presumption that they were gullible. His friends distanced themselves from him and waited for his downfall. They just assumed that his lies would catch up with him and his career would implode. A little mean-spirited, I suppose, but then again, they were insulted by his behavior, so I guess they just figured that he deserved justice. They were amazed as he continued to become more popular. They didn't understand why people kept believing his lies. Even though they weren't happy with him, they started to despise the people who believed in Stefan. So they blamed everybody, both Stefan and his fans. In addition to some of his outrageous and difficult-to-believe claims, there were other reasons that Stefan's popularity was surprising. In his books, he didn't offer any meaningful analysis. There was no insight into the minds of serial killers, rather only an emphasis on the morbid. Stefan had an interest in natural disasters, accidents, and pictures of dead bodies, which seemed to influence what material he included in his books. On top of not making any meaningful contribution to the field, he plagiarized other authors. He was unable or unwilling to write his own material. Why was Stefan so successful? How did he trick people for so many years? I think Stefan was able to be successful because he was intelligent and charming. He was able to leverage these characteristics into that first documentary, which gave him the opportunity to actually meet several serial killers. He didn't know what to do with those meetings, like he didn't have interviewing skills or a plan, but he did actually meet them. He took those legitimate meetings and started to spin and expand his resume based on them. He had a little bit of truth as a foundation on which he could build a sizable deception. I think this is a major reason he was able to get away with the deception for so many years. If somebody has legitimately experienced something a few times, and they simply increase that number when they retell the story, their narrative may remain credible. For example, if a firefighter had responded to the scene of 50 fires in his career, but he claimed that he had been to 250, the real stories of the 50 fires would convince many people that he was at the other 200 as well. As far as Stefan's backstory with the wife or fiancé, here he was playing the victim. People are usually reluctant to challenge the veracity of someone's sad story out of a fear of being thought of as insensitive. I don't know if Stefan made up the story in that way to gain that advantage. It may have just been an accident, like it was just an unintentional benefit of that particular story design. Some people have referred to Stefan as a pathological liar. The motive for a pathological liar is not usually money or other material gain. Rather, it is to have people think more of them, to be impressed by them. It's a way of compensating for low self-esteem. The deception feeds narcissistic desire. The irony of Stefan's situation is that he actually had some experience with serial killers. 
He noted that his accomplishments might have been enough on their own without his additions. His deception was unnecessary, unhelpful, and only served to destroy his reputation and career. Stefan made his living exploring the least interesting components of serial killers, and he never really tapped into the cognitive and emotional processes. He never actually did the real work of researching and understanding these terrible crimes. He did not educate people about serial killers. Rather, he used their murders to construct a fantasy of himself as some type of investigator who law enforcement officials would contact to gain access to his superior and extensive knowledge. The parallel between Stefan's story and the story of many serial killers is not lost on people. He didn't kill anybody, but he did repeatedly deceive and manipulate people. In the end, just like many serial killers, by the time he was caught, the damage was already done. Those are my thoughts on the case of Stefan Bouguan. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis on this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.